Hey everybody, welcome to today's talk on uh, leveraging the cloud with a blue-green architecture. My name is Jim Plush, Director of Engineering at CrowdStrike, and co-presenting with me will be uh, Sean Berry, one of our principal software engineers. Uh, so I'm gonna kinda go through the high level on a little bit about us, how we process data, our deployment model, uh, and then Sean's gonna touch on you know, how we actually built the system out. Um, so a little bit about us. Uh, CrowdStrike is a security, uh, cybersecurity startup founded a few years back, mainly focused on advanced persistent threats, uh, lateral movement, data exfiltration, uh, zero-day exploits. Uh, we have a product that installs on laptops, servers, uh, et cetera, and all that data is constantly streaming into our cloud system where it gets processed, matched up against machine learning models that our data science team built, et cetera. Um, so we've got a, a number of kind of security experts on staff, and when we started, you know, talking with them about our deployment process and what do we need to, you know, make sure we handle, they had the concept of the million dollar event, right? That's that, that one DNS query, it's that one network connection that could be the key to discovering a new vulnerability or a new uh, threat vector. So it's really important, especially when we do our deploy process, that we don't actually lose any data, uh, and then we treat each event as that, you know, million dollar event. So if you can picture like a toy example of a compromised machine uh, in our system. So user opens a malicious Word document. Uh, that sends an event up to our cloud system. That spawns command shell. Command shell relaunches Word before the user even notices. Uh, so we get that event. And then the command shell starts you know, making call outs. Uh, network connections starts bringing back some additional payloads, exfiltrates some data. And then at that point, they bounce to another machine or they cover their tracks and their output, they've gotten what they, they needed. So we kind of you know, reorganize all that data um, back in our, our cloud system and organize into different process trees, different UIs, um, so the you know, customer has an understanding of what happened uh, on their network. So this is kind of just a high level example of that, that data processing. So all those sensors are connected up to an SSL termination layer. Uh, we take all those events in, drop them in uh, to Kafka. And if you're not familiar with Kafka, it's kind of like Kinesis or a message queue. Uh, so we're just getting all those events in, dropping them into Kafka, and we have a number of consumers that then process the data through a, a you know, processing system, whether that again be uh, predictive analytics, uh, machine learning models, uh, other heuristics that we use to understand what's happening on that system, not only at the sensor level, but at, at the global level. So we're kind of in the high scale big data space, um, mainly deal with Fortune 500s, some large nonprofits, think tanks that are constantly under attack for uh, information. We're right around 100,000 events per second flowing in our cloud system sustained, and we're expected to you know, reach up in around 500,000 events per second uh, coming next year. And just for an example of data volume, it's about two to four terabytes of data per day per customer as it kind of fans through, uh, fans through our system. And we've built this on a microservice type architecture. So we knew kind of early on we were gonna be you know, in the big data space. And if you come from the monolithic app world, um, you've always got this app competing for CPU, memory, disk, and it's, it becomes a balancing act, right? So you're wasting a lot of resources. So from the beginning, we wanted to kind of build something you know, where each service was dedicated to a specific task. And then being in AWS, we could you know, provision that service, whether it be CPU or memory-based. Uh, and we're, you know, a pretty polyglot environment in that case, so our tech stack is fairly complicated. You probably see a lot of technologies you guys are familiar with. Um, but a lot of that's possible because we're kind of stitch it up together with uh, different AWS services. And, uh, and cost-wise, I don't even know if I would attempt the blue-green model uh, in a physical data center, just given the amount of machines that we'd have to run simultaneously means we'd have to virtualize our data center or containerize it, which we just didn't have the, uh, the staff for. So some of the problems we were trying to solve with our deployment architecture was, you know, you get into a situation where, you know, a new patch comes out and all of a sudden you have to, you know, refresh your entire fleet and operations comes running in and it becomes a big kind of panic mode uh, because you, you know, you gotta figure out what service can I take down? How do I orchestrate, you know, what has to come down before what service? And you have a situation where 
you know, service has been running for two years, person that wrote it doesn't even work here anymore. Um, so, you, you know, everyone's kind of scared to touch that thing over there. Um, so it just creates a real, real panic around deployments. Other models I've seen are the, the rolling restart model, which, you know, when you get to about 1,000 machines or more, you, know, you start doing groups of those restarts uh, until you hit, you know, server 600 uh, in groups of 50, you discover a catastrophic issue, and then you've got to start, you know, unwinding those changes back. Uh, meanwhile, you've probably impacted the customer for the 45 minutes it takes to roll back. Uh, also seen, you know, situations that people like to deploy on Friday nights, you know, hand it off to ops at, at midnight, right? We won't impact the customer. Problem with that is, uh, at some point, you're going to have to deploy during the day, and we prefer deploying when all of our developers are around. You get more eyes on the, on the code, right? You can kind of see, uh, you're just able to kind of triage issues faster. And then when we started thinking of blue-green for our event processing model, there's really not a lot of uh, literature out there on how to do that with message queues and Kafka and you know, how do we deal with the data layer? Like, everything is very simple. Like, oh, you just have a web server, and you flip a load balancer and a DNS or a DNS switch, and, and you're flipped over. But we have a, a pretty complicated event processing system, so we had to figure that out. So given those are primary objectives for our deployments, um, one, we wanted to minimize customer impact, right? We should be able to deploy on Wednesday at 10 a.m. and not have the customer even notice the deploy change until the release notes hit their inbox. Um, Maximize engineers' weekends. You know, you put a lot of money into recruiting people, hiring, training. Uh, you don't want to burn people out, you know, with deployments. So, you know, you're doing those Friday night, late night deployments. Um, you know, you can only do so many of those before people start uh, dropping out. And we wanted to reduce the uh, dependencies of rollouts. So in our case, we do a full cluster blue-green, so everything goes out together. Um, there's uh, other models that I'll get into. Uh, in a minute, but we wanted to minimize that, you know, service A has to come up because before service B because of some third party serialization change, and we need to orchestrate that. And then, you know, since we were in Amazon, we had to start thinking, how can we exploit the cloud to our advantage for this deployment model? And we really started forgetting about servers and IPs and started thinking of, you know, programmable data centers, right, ephemeral nodes, right? it's just a pool of resources. We don't even know what IPs are running in production, because they change based on auto scale, uh, they change when we do deployments, and you know we go by the philosophy that it should be easier to recreate the environment than to fix it. You know, if you're trying to triage a issue on a production server, and you're impacting you know your customer's experience, much easier to flip back to a previous version of that processing cluster, leave the old version running so you can debug, throw load at it, try and replicate the issue, um, and then you know minimize that customer impact. So just a quick refresher on blue-green, if you're not super familiar with it. Um, you can imagine a number of users connected up through a load balancer, router, what have you. Uh, they're hitting your web server. That's talking to an application server, to a shared database. Now you're ready to launch v2 of your application. So you spin up a new green cluster. You got v2 of, of, your, of your apps. You run tests through it. Everything looks good. You flip your switches, and now you're running on your v2 application. Meanwhile, you have blue still available in case you have to fail over, you have a catastrophic issue with your deployment. Uh, if everything does look good, you know, after some period of time, you power it down, and now you're, you're on the new cluster. So there's a couple of models there. There's the, the full cluster blue-green, which is kind of our approach, uh, and that's really where everything kind of goes out together uh, as one kind of processing unit. And we mainly picked that because you know, we're a small, still a small company, a uh, small team, so, you know, we can kind of coordinate our releases together. And then there's the app-based blue-green, which you'll kind of see in the Netflix-type model, where, you know, as, as we grow out and expand, then we can move into where specific teams own services and they can blue-green those applications independently. But we also have the ability to do a full cluster refresh for those, you know, heartbleed-type situations where you just have to patch everything as soon as possible. But, you know, you can't blue-green all the things, right? You're not blue-greening your databases. So we utilize a, uh, a common data plane that we call it. So blue and green both simultaneously talk to the data plane. Actually, let me go back there. Um, and what that means is essentially that all the code rollouts that we do has to be backwards compatible with 
previous versions. So if you're making some kind of destructive change, you know, you're taking a, a name column in the database and you're splitting out into first and last, that's a destructive change. Uh, so if you had to roll back, you would actually have to migrate that data over. So what we'll do is actually take the approach of writing the data to the multiple, you know, multiple steps, uh, let it go out for a couple deployments. The API should be changed to be able to handle if the data is available first and last name. If not, fall back to the name. And then you let that roll out a few releases and you establish a waterline of, I can't safely roll back my full cluster or specific apps beyond this point without causing uh, a data migration issue. So again, we generally deploy at the end of sprint releases together, uh, given we're still you know, relatively small team. But we do do hot fixes and upgrades frequently uh, outside of that process. Uh, and this is where our automation is being built out to support that app-based uh, blue-green. So early on, you know, we weren't quite sure about this approach. Right? It was somewhat painful, a lot of manual steps. It was actually way more than you know, we thought we'd have to build out. Uh, you know, it took an entire day to get a release out, which you know, is, is kind of a non-starter. But you know, we, uh, we decided to double down on the approach. And so if it was painful one day, we did it every day for weeks until we started ironing out those, those issues. Um, you know, what, was auto, what was manual on someone's laptop still? What did we have to check? What logs were we missing? How do we build this into a dashboard? And so we just kept iterating on it. And now today, it generally takes 45 minutes to the entire process of spinning up the new cluster, uh, running tests, canaries, regression tests. Uh, so it's, you know, it's pretty streamlined at this point. Uh, a lot of that's because we've had this sustaining engineer kind of role where every person on the team, including project managers, QA, everyone's run a deployment. And that helped us really iron out those last automation issues, making sure the documentation is up to date and everything makes sense. Uh, and you know, Sean built us an in internal UI where everything's just you know, clickable that he'll get into in a bit. So when deployment day comes, um, you know, we generally synchronize our repositories. We apply any data plane migrations. So if we're adding indexes or, or what have you, new column families in Cassandra. Um, let's say blue is running. We'll go ahead and spin up the green processing cluster. We'll go ahead and run our regression suite against green. No customers are on it yet, so we're getting a, you know, a fresh run of uh, known sequences of events. If everything looks good there, we'll then start flipping Canary customers over. So we dog food our own product, so we'll you know, roll our company over to the new code path. So in case there was you know, a sensor update in between our deploys and there's some new event kind of sequence, we'll be able to uh, catch that before uh, customers are impacted. Um, at that point, we'll switch into active-active mode, so both are running simultaneously. And if everything looks good, after a few minutes, we'll deactivate blue, but leave it running in case we have to do a catastrophic failover. Um, knock on wood, we haven't had to do that yet, but you know, we have that ability. Uh, and you can see why the cost model in AWS makes sense, because now we're running you know, thousands of machines simultaneously in each environment. If that looks good after an hour, we power that down, because um, it's you know, pretty safe to carry on with the deployment. So some of the keys to success for, for us in our kind of event processing model, one, it's you know, focus on automation. It's got to be a priority in the organization and not something someone does in their spare time. You gotta actually dedicate you know, resources to it. Uh, instrumentation and metrics. So our Go apps, our JVM apps uh, are all you know, fully instrumented with counters and we track everything and all that feeds into a central aggregation system so that when you're running a deploy, you can easily know, you know what looks normal, what looks, what looks healthy. Provisioning systems, being able to, you know, again, recreate your environment rather than fix it. So we use a mixture of Chef and half-baked AMIs. Uh, Sean's going to get into that process. But it's essentially, you know, being able to not worry about uh, a machine on the fritz and just, you know, kill the VM and let it respawn in a, a you know, a known state. Regression tests are really key for this kind of system. Uh, you know, we have a microservice Again, architecture, we have 50 services. We can't watch them all. One person's not going to watch them all. So being able to know that those services are healthy and that you can send deterministic input out, get back the responses of what you assume the state of the world should be you know, after that change. Uh, canary customers, being able to you know, segment part of your user base over onto a new application 
uh, version without impacting your entire fleet of users. Uh, so we're going to get into that as well and how we do that. Feature flags. So we have 50 services. Uh, if something goes wrong, we're usually not going to you know, halt the entire deployment. There's a UI feature that's broken or an API in the back end that's not functioning properly after we bring up the new cluster. Um, because we have everything behind a feature flag, we're able to kind of shut things off, let the deployment carry on, have the developer hotfix it, flip the feature back on, uh, and it's deployed at that point. So unified app requirements. You also, especially when you're doing this kind of architecture, you, know, you don't want it to be the Wild West, right? You want kind of unified, a unified deployment model that these systems can plug into uh, to be successful. So health checks, is there an endpoint that ops knows they can always automate and hit and know that your service is healthy? Uh, packaging, I've seen some teams use tar files, some rsync, some have Debian packages. If you're not kind of standardizing on your packaging model, uh, it becomes really difficult to tie this into automation uh, and just you know, constantly writing these one-off scripts. So we do Debian packages. If you have Python, Go, Scala, everything gets deployed as a Debian package. Uh, Sean's going to touch branching. Logging is another key one to be able to automate this kind of system. Um, you know, some teams have a warn is an error and an error is a warn. And you know, one team will log to syslog, one team will log to you know, foo log in, in var. Um, so it makes it, again, difficult to plug into your, your automation, right? You should, should have a standard way of, of what is an error, what does that mean, what do I do when I see that? Is that bad? Is a lot of them bad? Um, so that way you can kind of build these dashboards out and know, immediately know the, the health of the system. Uh, deployment history. It's kind of a given being able to go back into a known state and uh, recreate the state of the world. You know, if you have some kind of issue, you know, when you bring the cluster up or you've discovered something that three versions ago was an issue, you can kind of take that whole release and throw it in your integration cluster. So how we know we've kind of been successful on this approach uh, so every person on the team at one point has said, thank God we have blue-green. Uh, it's not that we've never had a bad deployment. We've just never had a deployment that's infected customers, um, knock on wood. And since we've got it fully automated out, we've been through over 100 deployments. Um, you know, if something comes up in a bad state, it's not a you know, time of panic. It's let's think about it rationally. Customers aren't impacted yet. Let's take some debugging steps, look at it. Sometimes we say, power it down. Too many issues, let's go look at it in integration uh, and rerun load testing or something. Uh, also, if you're a Kafka user, we're uh, partnering with Joe Stein from BDOSS to release a Java and a new Go Kafka client that'll support this kind of blue-green switchover model uh, and also provide you know, at least once message guarantees to make sure when you do the switchover, you can uh, be guaranteed that those operations have been completed. So with that, I'll turn over to Mr. Sean to kind of work through the, uh, the details. All right, thank you, Jim. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, there's a number of ways to orchestrate and architect a blue-green system, right? There's the siphoning off traffic away from one cluster over to another cluster. There's the load balancer flipping switch trick. Uh, what I want to go through are really the ways that we uh, designed our system to, to work with our event stream processing so that we guarantee that we don't lose any data, right? Because as Jim alluded to earlier, we have this concept of like the million dollar event, right? We can't miss anything because any one particular event could be the thing that lets us know that there's an intrusion that started. So first, I just want to give you a little bit of a really simplified uh, bullet points on what exactly Kafka is. So Kafka is a distributed commit log. Right? You can think about it sort of like a message queue. Um, the main difference is going to be that with a message queue, you pull off a message. That message is then act and then deleted. Right? Kafka is going to persist that message for as long as you've configured Kafka to persist that message. And it's up to a consumer of this stream to maintain its own offset. So the power that that gives you is if you have any kind of failure, individual consumers 
can reset or play back from an earlier part in the stream, right? So you can recover if for some reason a service was having issues and you know started out of memorying a box and you lost all these events, you can simply push your pointer into that stream to an earlier place and replay all those events. So blue-greening starts with a running cluster. In this case, it's the blue cluster. And we have all these sensors installed in the field, and they're connecting through an elastic load balancer to our termination servers. Now, the termination servers are the main ingestion point for all of that data, right? And those are handing off all of these events over to our content routers. And the content routers are writing to active topics in Kafka. I'll explain what the whole concept of active and inactive topics means. But the important thing is our content routers in blue are writing to active, and our content processors are reading from that same active stream. When we go to launch a new cluster, in this case green, we have a whole UI uh, that's been built up over time that allows us to start this deployment process. In this case, we have a blue cluster running, and we're ready to launch green. So we click a few buttons, and we launch green. So the green cluster is launched. And the really important thing to start is that our termination servers in green are kept out of the load balancer by just simply failing health checks. Right? This is an externally accessible load balancer. So if those termination servers were available, you know, customers could start connecting right away, and we don't want that yet, right? We need to test this system first. Now, our content routers in green are writing to the active topics just like blue, right? The key differentiator right now is that the processors are reading from an inactive topic or set of topics, right? And I'll explain exactly what that means, but this is one of the most important things in allowing us to do our canarying system. Right, where we're going to push some amount of traffic over into our green processing layer later. When we launch the cluster, it's really important to get our sizing right. So for any given auto scale group, we start off by setting a minimum and maximum number that we're going to be expecting for that instance, right, for that, for that role. We can usually determine that pretty accurately, uh, even for a new role, because we have an idea of how much of our traffic any new role is going to be having to take care of, right? So we have a way to set a min and a max, but we also have a script that, right when we're ready to deploy, will determine what's actually running in the currently active environment. So you can imagine a case where you have a min and a max of 10 and 20, and you normally just run at 10, right? That handles everything. But then you have some new load, right? Maybe you have new customers that came online. Maybe there was some kind of problem, and it caused the load. So you've scaled up, right? You're running 16 now. So when you go to replace that blue cluster with a new green cluster, you want to make sure that you're going to replace it with something that can handle that same load that blue's been handling. So this is a tiny snippet from a much larger script that, for any given region, will pull out the number of instances running for each of our autoscale groups and return that back to this screen from the UI. So what this is doing is showing us what we're about to launch and where we're about to launch it. And you'll see that some of these boxes are highlighted in red. That's a visual indicator to us that we've reached the maximum number of instances for that um, autoscale group. Right? That might have occurred because we simply have more customers. Right? We're processing more events. Uh, that might have occurred because there was some bug, right? And we caused the load ourselves, and we auto-scaled. But this is the call out to tell us so that we can determine, do we need more instances? Do we need to raise our maximum so we can scale higher than this? Because right now, we're capped out. And this is also the place that we have the chance to scale back down, right? We don't proactively auto-scale down um, simply because of this requirement that we absolutely cannot lose data, and automating that would be a little bit hairy for us. So to bootstrap our boxes, we use a combination of user data and Chef. 
And we do what's commonly called chef or inside out chef bootstrapping, right? That's where our individual instances are going to contact the chef server and through the use of our user data, tell it what they want to become. Uh, that's opposed to the outside in where the chef server would have uh, knowledge about all of the different instances and tell them what to become. And since we didn't feel comfortable running a wget and just piping that to bash, right? I hope none of you feel comfortable doing that. Uh, we maintain our own custom version of the chef installer. Through user data, we give it information about what version of chef to install, where the chef servers are, which role it's going to become, and what environment it lives in. So we've launched a new cluster. We're ready to test, right? So the first thing we need to do is we need to canary our test customer. And on the next slides, I'll explain exactly how that works and what it means. But it has to be done. Then our integration test suite runs by connecting directly to one of our green termination servers. Remember, they're not in any ELB, so the only traffic that's going to be getting processed right now is via our tests. After our tests run and pass, we canary real customers. So how do we canary customers, right? We can't lose anything. How does this work? So we make use of Zookeeper, right? Here's a screenshot from uh, one of Netflix's uh, OSS projects exhibitor uh, that just gives you a visual of what's going on. Everything's stored in Zookeeper for canaries. And since we dog food our own tech, every single time we run a deployment, CrowdStrike are the first people to be testing out the new code. <clears throat> now, if you remember, our inactive processing layer, this is the green side, right? They're set to read from these inactive topics I mentioned. Right? These are just standard Kafka topics, right? A Kafka topic is just a string, except we append on a dot inactive to the end of it. And our ingestion layer, or our content router, has a watcher on this Z node right here. And every time it gets an update, it knows I need to canary this customer, right? So all it has to do is start writing that customer's data over to our inactive topic. And when we're ready to test real traffic, we canary several customers, and then we start the monitoring process. Here's just a more of a visual of what's going on. So the event, the event ingester or content router is writing to the active topic. Blue processors are reading from that active topic. This is just regular traffic for us. Customer one, two, three, and customer four, five, six are canaried. The event ingester is notified and starts routing all of their traffic to inactive topics, which are picked up by the green processors. Right? So now we have our green processors actually doing some work. And of course, we have a UI built around this, right? We don't want to be going and manually changing things, even through Exhibitor. So that's how we do it. So for testing, we run about 3,000 regression and integration tests, right? If tests fail, we just triage, figure out if it's something we can move forward for with, you know, even though it's failing. And the way we can do that typically would be turning off some new feature, right? Everything that we're doing is putting, being put behind a feature flag. This allows us the ability to determine, OK, we're going to move forward with the deployment, but not with that feature. We'll get that feature next time, right? And we're only done testing and ready to move forward when we're 100% passing, right? We don't move forward uh, with even a single failing test. And if we fail tests, this is what we see. That was before I shaved. And that's what we strive to see. So we've launched our green cluster, right? We, we've canaried some customers. We're running our tests. Everything's passing. Things are looking good. Now we're just monitoring, right? We're just looking at everything green is doing. We, we, we want to look for problems or the absence of them. So we're verifying that health. We're inspecting all of our graphical data, our dashboards, our log outputs, everything we can get our hands on, really, to verify that. And then we're rerunning all of our tests. This whole time, tests are just running, right? Because now we have load. So 
if our tests happen to pass the first time because we have no load, well, that's great, but now we want to rerun those tests. So just a little bit about logging and error checking. So every one of our servers has a Splunk forwarder installed on it. And because of the consistency with which we do our logging, the, the Splunk forwarder can be set up in the exact same way, can forward the exact same file to the exact same place. So all of our logs are aggregated, collected in one place. And then we've set up several dashboards, right, to inspect all of this, give us some kind of graphical representation of what exactly is going on. And then, of course, these raw logs are streamed in near real time. And we're specifically looking for errors, right? Error type logs. Um, because we are so you know, persistent in what we choose to deem as an error, we know if we see errors, it's bad, right? We don't just log, you know, oh, I increased my counter by five, error. Right? That's an info or a debug or something. If it's not catastrophic, it's a warn, right? So we're looking for these errors. This is a super important step, right? We really need to be comfortable knowing that our system is healthy before we move on, because now we want to move real traffic over. These are just some of the screens of some of the dashboards that we set up over time. These two on the top are Splunk. They happen to be blue-green specific. Um, so we have blue-green specific dashboards we look for and just general dashboards. Uh, the bottom two are from Datadog. And the really important thing here is that any one of our engineers, QA, testers, they, because they've all run these deployments, right, they've all looked at all these screens. And they can really quickly look and with, you know, not more than a glance, say whether or not they're looking at a healthy or an unhealthy system. So when it's time to move our customers over, finally, the first thing we need to do is we need to flip everyone back away from being a canary. Then we're going to activate the green cluster. Now, activating the green cluster is going to make those termination servers available through the ELB, right? So someone who's just turning on their laptop or, or happens to bounce the network might end up on our green side. And our event processors are consuming from, on both sides, the active, and our event ingestion layer is writing to those active topics, right? So we're in a state of active-active at this point. And this is just a quick graphic of what active-active does, right? Just breaking out the processing layer. So inactive is the green processors, blue processors are reading from active, we're ready to flip the switch. Zookeeper tells them to activate. They have the watcher. They start processing off the active stream just like blue. So this is where it's really important that our code is forward compatible, right? We're going to be dealing with two different clusters, two different code bases, different features, processing events you know, randomly as they get pulled off of uh, the Kafka queue. But it is important that the blue and green sides are fully partitioned from one another. Once an event ends up on the blue side, it stays on the blue side until the end of its life, right? Until we fully processed it. Likewise with green. So this allows us for doing things like making a breaking API change that's specific to that environment or changing serialization that's going to be used to you know, send data between them. So we're ready to flip the switch. We deactivate blue. So that's going to force all of our termination servers in blue to fail health checks. They're going to disconnect from the ELB. All of our sensors connected on the blue side are going to get a, you know, a connection reset. They're going to immediately try to reconnect. They're going to hit the ELB and get routed to the green servers. Right? Our blue processors switch now to read from the inactive. And then once all of our inactive consumers have caught up to the heads of their streams. You know, we've processed everything that inactive has. We can decommission blue. As Jim mentioned earlier, we leave it around for, you know, one, two hours maybe in case we need to do that immediate flip back. And then it's time to get rid of them. So green is our active cluster. 
If we need to roll back, we always snapshot our repository, put it into S3. We haven't had to do that yet, but it is very reassuring knowing that we can if we have to. For the last uh, 10 minutes here, I just want to go through what we've done to ease the pain of this process. So bootstrapping our boxes faster, right? You're replacing an entire uh, set of machines when you're doing the full cluster, right? You want these boxes to come up fast. So the first thing we did is we started using half-baked AMIs. So if you're not familiar with this idea, Amazon has you know, several AMIs to choose from, pre-canned. What it allows you to do is pull one of those down, start it, make updates to it, and then package it all back up as a new AMI that has some things done to it, right? It's not fully ready for production. It's not actually running any of our code, but it does do things like, since we have such a large Scala code base, it'll pre-install the JVM, you know, Tomcat, so that that's already there, because we don't want to have to install that on all of our, on all of our Java or you know, Scala machines every time we boot up. It'll install common tools and configurations and make sure that we have the latest patched, up-to-date OS, right? Really important, especially given all of the recent uh, things like Heartbleed. And our build plan is run twice daily. And that build plan looks like this. Our Bamboo plan runs, and we have several different AMIs. Here's just one example. It starts a, an auto-scale group of size one. And that auto-scale group works like any of them. Right? It communicates with a chef server using user data, saying, what should I do? What cookbook should I run? In this case, it installs uh, an OS patched version, installs the JVM, and using AWS tools, repackages itself as an AMI, pushes itself up to S3, and then becomes available in the autoscale groups. So there's one final step that we require, and it's manual, and we, we've chosen for it to be a manual process, and that's promoting an AMI to being production ready. So that's just going in and changing permissions on that AMI, and then it's available for blue and green. How we get code ready is also really important to this process for us. So when we commit code on main in any of our repositories, that kicks off bamboo, uh, another bamboo plan. That plan will build if it needs to be compiled, it'll compile it. It'll package up a Debian, push that out to our development repo, regenerate the repo, call a pretty complex Python script that will inspect, figure out what code changed, what roles that code change affects, what IP addresses are running the roles that were affected, and then we'll proceed doing a rolling restart in our development cluster. It's finalized by running tests and then reporting everything back to, you know, as far as what happened in our IRC channel and then via email. In production, if we cut a release dash version or a hotfix dash version branch and push that to origin, that also kicks off a bamboo plan. The key thing here, though, is it, when, once it packages up the Debian, it pushes it to two places pushes it to our integ repo and to our production repo. So it builds it once and pushes it to both places. Exact same binary. And then through our web UI, we choose which packages are going to be going out to our in, in, in integ this time. We sync those, generate a new repository, and launch integ. Once integ is up, we're running tests, running tests nonstop. And we're running load tests as well, right? Just our normal integration suite, but also a, a, a full load test for however long we think is necessary to prove the worthiness of the new code. When it's time to launch it out into production, because we have the exact same binary copied in both places, we can regenerate that exact uh, repository available in our production VPC without actually copying the code across, right? We've already copied it originally. So we can be confident that when we launch our production, um, our production cluster this time, that it's going to be running the exact same stuff that we've been testing in Integ for the past few days or a week. And of course, we have a web UI built around that too. So here we choose different versions 
of various packages. This is actually a really long page. For any one of them, we can click on it and get some information about what exactly is in that package, what dependencies it has, et cetera. We sync that to our Integ repo. Um, at this point, we can launch Integ. We can shut it back down. Or we can choose to sync this to what we call our beta staging, which is the place right before this goes out to production. So we do that, generate the repo, and at this point, we can choose whether this is going to be a blue-green deployment or it's going to be a hotfix deployment, a rolling restart. With the blue-green, we're going to be generating a brand new repository. Uh, with a rolling restart, we're going to be doing an atomic swap of the current repository and then allowing Chef to be the one to go through and do a rolling restart of those machines to get the updated code. The last thing I want to touch on is updating the data plane. Jim made some comments um, related to this earlier. But specifically with you know, SQL type um, databases, we made sure that our migration system only supported forward migrations. Right? We have several people on the, on the team that have experience doing forward and backward migrations you know, for every Migration one up, there's a one down, and two up and two down. Uh, it, the costs totally outweigh the benefit for us, right? We're forward only. If we need to undo a migration, we write a new migration that undoes it next time. And our code must be forward compatible, right? If we do a migration and only realize there's a problem three deploys later, the co and we need to, you know, all of a sudden, uh, relaunch the code from, you know, three, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. We need to be certain that we don't need to do anything destructive to the database. So our code always needs to be able to handle, you know, unexpected things in our schemas, for example. And very importantly, our database schemas are only modified via migrations. This is for dev, integ, and production. People, you know, nobody even has like credentials to get in the database and do anything to modify tables. And then we use an in-house migration service. Uh, we base it around an open source project, a Java project called Flyway, which has been pretty solid. And we do this mostly because we want to parallelize this process. Each one of our customers has their own database, so we have to apply migrations separately to each one of them. So I just want to give some final thoughts. So blue-green deployments can be done in lots of ways, right? I already mentioned some in the beginning. But we have strict requirements. We can't lose those million-dollar events. So that was really the driving force that made this the best solution for us. In the automation and tooling, it took a long time, and it was a lot of work. But it was done by two people. Shout out to Dennis. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter how big your organization is. Two people were able to do this, and it really started with a whole bunch of manual scripts, right? Some bash scripts and, you know, some Python here and some Ruby there. And it was really stitched together with, you know, a, a web UI and then refactored and reworked. So anybody can do this uh, if, if they want to dedicate the time. And it has been completely worth it. It was a lot of hard work. We have a robust, repeatable, reliable, fault-tolerant deployment system, and it has saved us already, and I hope it can save you, too. Thank you. Thank you.